Joe Darlington from Being James Bond here to talk about my uh, one of my favorite Roger Moore. Oh come on! What, what's what's what happened? What what happened to the I, onesie? I well, I mean, we're we're talking about Roger Moore here, so I had to like represent. This is the, it's kind of like his outfit that he has at the end of the film. Uh huh. He he has like this really cool blue turtleneck, and he's got. I mean, he's got the the, the military outfit on, the right, naval right. commander outfit. But this is close. It's okay. got some gold buttons, and there you go. I think Matt Spazer would approve of the fit. It's not a Tom Ford fit, but I have to get, right. I, dude. I've got to get into the style mood. I, okay, I it's got just, you. Right. It's just how I'm wired. <laughs> Very good. So what? Are, what film are we talking about? We are talking about uh, the Spy Who Loved Me, Roger Moore's yes. third Bond film. Third Bond film. Yep. All right, and and. There's a premise we had yep. that we introduced in our last film when we were talking about Goldfinger. As, yep. as, as Joe and I have been going over these films, we have certain theories, and they're just theories mm -hmm. until they're proved out. But we've talked about the third Bond film of each of the actors that have actually had a third Bond film. Mm -hmm. they, they seem to get into their own stride, finally. I yep. mean, the, the, the actor gets a little bit more comfortable. The plots are there. I mean, it really is a solid, solid Bond film. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, let's let's chat about it. Let's right. talk about the different aspects. Let's see if it checks off mm. on a hit list and see if it proves it out. So yeah. we're here to talk about Roger Moore's third outing. Yes, sir. Yes, All sir. right. So overall, how do you like this film? Uh, I like it a lot. I think it's a it's a really great. It's an incredibly ambitious film. Yes. Uh, I, I there are there are some Roger Moore films that I think are just kind of just good enough and they're fine. Uh, this one they they really pulled out all the stops and I think it I think in every scene it shows it shows in its in its overall story and its plot how the stakes kind of go up up up. That also happens within individual action scenes where the stakes kind of get higher and higher. Uh, the the pre-title is a fantastic example of this, mm -hmm. where they just kind of went crazy. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a great film. It's a teeny bit cartoony for me in in mm -hmm. parts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we kind of know what I like in, in my my James Bond films, uh, but this one even kind of counterbalances a little bit of the cartooniness with some moments that are a little more down to earth. So I think it does pretty damn good. So they they saw me make a face when you said cartoony because you're the gentleman who. One of the well, actually, his favorite Roger Moore film mm. has a Tarzan yell going through it. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> right. Which and I, telling which, a, if I a lion, it out, a tiger to sit. Yeah. At, at least in Octopussy, they take all their cartoony moments and they cram it into one scene. For the most part, <laughs> they did anyway. do that. What were they smoking right? that, that day? I it's like a little right? jungle just, ganja or something. <laughs> I don't know what was going on. But I agree with you. I think the plot here, first of all, it, it's a solid plot. Mm. You know, the um, and we're going to talk about the different aspects, but overall, I did like this film. Now, this has got a, a certain warmth in my heart. Mm. It is the first Bond film I ever saw in the theater. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah. so I, I told this story before, so I'll mm. keep it short, but Atlantic City, we went there for a yearly pilgrimage from Middletown, New York to Atlantic City, and this particular time, it was very rainy, and my father said, we're going to go to a film. Mm. And it was The Spy Who Loved Me. So we got off the boardwalk, no planter peanuts that day, no taffy, no million dollar pier. And we went right to The Spy Who Loved Me. <laughs> and I was just like, what on earth is this? Yeah. And just getting pummeled by it. And it was shocking to me how memorable it is. Because to this day, I remember being in the theater and seeing like some of the shark scene. Yeah, yeah. And just looking around just to make sure that we weren't like in an aquarium. <laughs> but but that's that's yeah. the, the mind yeah. process of a, of a young child. Yeah. So this does have a special place in my heart. Mm. But we got to talk about Roger Moore because we talk about the different portrayals of Bond. Mm. Um, and, and it's great because Joe just released, in fact, we'll put a link to it just for a bit of fun here, just released literally a ranking of your Roger Moore films. Yep. Yep. And yeah. where did The Spy Who Loved Me rank on those? It was third from the top. It was third from the top. Yeah. And then it was Free Eyes Only and then Octopussy. Yep. Correct? Okay. So it's kind of middle for you. Yeah, as far as Roger Moore is concerned. Again, it, it, it see, ironically, and it it probably does work in this series we're doing where we're asking about the third film sort of coming into their own. And I think that 
this is where kind of Roger Moore does sort of come into its own, his own and, and really does deliver on the entertainment factor. Yeah. You know, I mean, this one, again, like I said, they, they don't cut any corners with this one. Uh, so, but yeah, it's just, I mean, it's, again, it, it, you know, for your eyes only, Octopus, I mean, those two are my, you know, particular favorites, but this is one of those, like Goldfinger, that I just sort of look at it and I can't argue with it. Yeah. You know, it works on its own merits. I love how you said Roger Moore came into his own. I agree, because I think Live and Let Die was that, you know, almost like Pierce Brosnan's portrayal mm. in GoldenEye. He's he's a little overly serious, which isn't, nothing mm. wrong with it. He just got the part, just got the role. Yeah. He's a little bit younger. And then, you know, Man with the Golden Gun kind of got a little goofy, right. a little awry. And then mm. this film, to me, brought him back in a much more comfortable way. Yeah. Just in the sense of, you know, he still had that, Roger Moore charm, mm. but he wasn't Roger Moore playing Roger Moore, yeah, as some right. people have said yet. Yeah. But he he seemed like he had some very serious moments, but he could also do the romance. Yep. He could do the lover mm. bond, yeah, yeah. and he could also do, dare I say, he could also do the spy intrigue moments, the things mm. with the pyramids. Yep. You know, to me is some of the best, you know, kind of cat and mouse chasing scenes yeah, yeah. in yeah. any of the Bond films. Yeah. Yes, I, I completely agree with that. And he, I mean, Roger Moore, I mean, one of the things I've always said about Roger is that he could do whatever you asked him to do. If, if he's going to do over-the-top fun Moonraker stuff, he can do it. If you need him to get serious, for your eyes only, he can do that too, yeah. uh, without missing a step. And here is a great example of that. I mean, again, Roger can do fun, you know, lighthearted, but then mm -hmm. he gets into these, these, these serious moments where Anya confronts him about killing the boyfriend, he can do that too. He's there, you yeah. know, and he and he plays it perfectly. I mean, it's scripted perfectly. I love that scene, frankly. You never hear Bond kind of go, uh, "No, I didn't do that. Uh, I, I must have been some other guy." And he didn't say, "Honey, I'm so sorry." He right. said, "Yes, he did it." He goes, "Yes, I did it," you know, yeah. and he doesn't apologize. It's kind of incredible, frankly. And, and again, there, there are moments where, you know, again, we sort of look at Roger in the big scheme of the Bond world and say. Oh, he was light and fun, and that was it. Yeah. He no, he was much more than that. He could kind of do pretty much anything. And and by the way, also coming into his own Bond wise, they also brought back a lot of Bond elements that you hadn't seen for Roger do. You know, Roger was sort of he came in, he wanted to be not, he wasn't trying to do what Lazenby did, which was to be the next Connery. Hmm. Roger was doing his own thing, so he smoked cigars, he drank bourbon. Now suddenly, martini shaking, not stirred. Yeah. You're, you're kind of getting the Bond elements back again. Yeah, I agree, and I don't know what it was with the jumps, especially from the man with the golden gun to this one, but he got more capable as Bond. Yeah. Like in that last scene when it's the all-out fight and there's explosions and gunfire, he doesn't look awkward holding a machine gun. Mm. You know, for a couple of the punching scenes and things that are going on, they're totally believable in this yeah. one. With the man with the golden gun, he quite can't quite kick over his karate belt. Yeah, you know, there yeah, there were those yeah. disconnects where I'm just like, I don't think this guy could really kick ass. Yeah, yeah. In this movie, he seems dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. No. He. Yeah. He. They're they're doing it right with this one. They they really are. They're playing to his strengths, and he's just nailing it. He is. All right. We got to talk about his nemesis, the Man. bad guy. What'd you think of the bad guy in this film? Our our web fingered friend. Yeah. You know. <laughs> You know, it, it's it's taken me many viewings before I finally noticed the web hand. Oh, really? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's so I that subtle; it's almost you almost miss it. Yeah, um, yeah, I was a little slow on the update <laughs> for that one. Um, I, I think he's fine. You're kind of getting into that sort of um, again megalomaniacal, doing everything from a chair, bad guy, yeah. um, and that's fine. I, I don't know if he's the most memorable. I, I, the only thing I really remember about Stromberg is that he's always got his mouth full. He's always <laughs> shoving food into his face. Yeah. Well, he's Just, like a fish. He's constantly eating. You know, krill. And... <laughs> right. So maybe that's maybe that's the uh, um, maybe that's the theme that I'm missing. But yeah, I mean, so he, he's, he's fine. You know, yeah. just kind of nothing really memorable. Yeah, I. There were certain aspects I liked about him. I think he was an interesting combination of kind of Doctor No subdued. Mm. So there wasn't a ton yeah. of him. 
Yeah. You know, there, there's not these long expositions. Mm. He's not a part of the action, for example. He's got his plans, and, you know, he's he's kind of mm. nefarious. Yeah. But then he also, you're right, he has these Blofeld moments where he's just kind of sitting back, watching things unfold, pressing buttons, yeah, clicking yeah. it. You know, he's he's more like a spectator bad guy yeah. than a bad guy that forwards the plot along. Right. He, I, I think, I think, and I, I could be wrong, and I'll be curious if anybody can tell me in the comments, I think he's got to be the only bad guy who's actually who actually meets his demise still sitting in the chair. Like he's still oh. sitting down when Bond does him in. He doesn't even get up, you know. There for is that one moment. other Bond guy, a bad guy. Who am I missing? Who meets a demise in his chair? Three eyes only. Yes, but I, but even then, at still least then, contestant. right? The chair is at least a couple hundred feet in the air. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But I'm sure when it hits, he's still sitting. But technically, he's still in for the like chair. Like a split absolutely. second. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So bad guy, I think for you and I. Mm, all right, so we got to talk about Triple X, and not yeah. it's the same film, folks. It's it's the Bond girl, <laughs> uh, Barbara Bach. What yeah. did you think of her as a Bond girl? Her portrayal, uh, mm. her acting, all of it. Well, I think acting is okay. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I kind of find yeah. that she she's another one where her delivery is is well enough. You know, I, I wouldn't yeah. say that she's a like a fantastic actress. Uh, she's stunning to look at, and and they. They use her very well. Like I've seen, I'll see some movies where they take a very limited actress and they try to get her to do all kinds of things to emote and to shout and do whatever, just to say, "Look at me, I'm really an actress." Right. This one doesn't do that. It it, it kind of plays it low key, and I think yeah. that's great. And I think the confrontation with her and Bond with the picture of the boyfriend, uh, she's fine. She's absolutely fine. I think Roger's doing a little bit of the heavy lifting in that scene, but uh, but. She does very well. And of course, like I said, just amazing to look at. So I'm going to say something very controversial. It could be controversial. I may piss off a lot of people. I feel like with Roger Moore's tenure, until we get to Octopussy, all of the Bond girls mm. were there to supplement and support Roger Moore's bigger-than-life portrayal of Bond. Mm. I feel like, and maybe, maybe he just would overshine them yeah, because yeah. of his bigness and charming nature. Right. But I feel like, I mean, if you literally go through and you take a look at Jane Seymour, who comes across mm. as petite because she is petite yeah. and quiet and things like that, and she's she's there as the Bond girl. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, you know, Mary Goodnight and yeah. you know, Maud Adams' portrayal of that woman who mm. gets killed very quickly, very slight, very... Well, in this film, you have Barbara Brock, who I liked the character, yeah. but I think her screen presence is diminutive. It's very mm. small yeah. as opposed to Bond. Right. And then Melina, in A View to a Kill, yeah. so I keep saying that, Free Eyes Only, is kind of there, right. but she's not that strong spearhead. Mm. It's only when you get to Octopussy do I feel like, and Moonraker, Holly Goodhead, yeah. Moon, um, Octopussy feels like there's that strong Bond girl yeah. that can hold her own. Yes. I would agree with that. Yeah, I think Octopussy is a great example of where both because um, even Magda's character is very capable and she's very assertive and she's there to get something from James Bond and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of goes one-ups him a little bit. Uh, yeah, I think up until then, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of female characters who are... Victims is not really the right word, but 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 the plot is happening to them. Solitaire yes. is, is essentially a kept woman. Um, Maude Adams in Golden Gun, certainly the same way. Uh, Britt Brit Eklund, Mary Goodnight. Not not a victim per se, but I mean, even she's sort yeah. of held captive by the end. Um, and not very assertive. Before anybody says out there, oh, well, it's a sign of the times. Up until a certain point, the women were... I would disagree because the Connery women mm. don't feel like they were being taken along for a ride. They, yes. I feel like they were driving in many of the cases. Many of the yeah. perils and situations that Bond would get into yeah. were because of some of the Bond women. Sure, absolutely. And, 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 and I mean, again, you, I mean, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not certainly arguing against the damsel in distress because, right. again, we are men and we like watching these movies and, you know, part of the fantasy of it is that we're going to rescue the, 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 the girl and, and win the day. Because we do and, the opposite in our real lives. Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> Calling a spade a spade. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, so... I've got to mention, since I came on in full regalia, mm. literally, uh, the Bond style. Now, people would say that Roger Moore, his whole curriculum of Bond style was mm. a little bit a sign of the times. I would actually disagree. I think that, especially in The Spy Who Loved Me, I love the military clothing look. Yeah. I think things were buttoned up. It's mm. interesting, in in researching for this 
video that we're doing, I looked up casual Bond moments mm. in here. This was the most casual. Literally a turtleneck with a right, sports right, jacket. Right. Otherwise, he's wearing ties. Yeah, yeah. And sports jackets and blazers and suits sure. and everything. I mean, he looked the money. And yeah, I mean, are things starting to flare out a little bit and lapels getting a little bit big? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that was part of the fashion mm. of yeah. the time. So it's hard for me to ding him for that. Yeah, I yeah, and honestly, I don't really mind the flare in this one. I kind of feel like even the gun barrel where where the the pants are getting just a little bell bottomy. I I yeah. kind of don't mind that. I kind of I almost see that as kind of um, like like it's like boot cut. What we would call boot cut. Boot cut of jeans. You know, nice. not, like not quite. Yeah. The, the, the bell big bottom flare. boot cut. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I I think Roger's looking top notch. I mean, it, it's pretty um, impressive that he's literally wearing a tuxedo. Yes. He goes from the party. He's out in the desert. They're they're in the back of the van. They're sleeping on the boat at one point, and he's still looking. Perfectly put together, <laughs> and and I would even say I'll take your 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 boot cup, you know, bell bottom thing and mm. extend it. When they're walking in the desert, that boot cut actually helps because it's almost like a sway. Yeah, yeah. And it's like it perfect for that you know mm. Lawrence of Arabia type look. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, you don't right. want a Tom Ford suit. Yes, yes. Hugging and clinging to you, yes. you want something that's going to move. It's almost like you, you're sort of it, it, you could imagine the, the the pants being a little breathable. You know, then you would need that in that heat. Look so. at Joe talking about style. <laughs> Matt Spazer, <laughs> move on over. Welcome, Joe Darling. I got a long way to go. Before right, I maybe, maybe, here, Matt maybe you got a little bit of room yet. <laughs> uh, all right, so we've got to talk about um, uh, one of my favorite things: the the gadgets and fun mm. aspect. I yeah. mean, you've got you've got I'm like literally going to do this right here. You know, you've got everything from a, a yep. ski pole. Let me take that off. A ski pole that you know fires and yeah. things like that, all the way through to a bunch of different uh, props and gadgets yeah. and. Thing. So what did you think of like the fun factor of the Spy Who Loved Me? Uh, yeah, it's kind of hitting it on the head too. And they're also, you know, I, again, this is something I don't know if they have done before, but I like the idea that sometimes these gadgets just come out of left field, hmm. you know, as opposed to something that has a very standard Q scene where Q gives him gadget number one, gadget number two, gadget number three, and then yeah. you watch the film and you see how they're going to fall into place. Yeah. This one, all of it, he's skiing, all of a sudden now the thing's got a trigger on it. You know, he's... Yeah. he's uh, and of course, the Lotus scene is spectacular. Oh and, my gosh! And there's just buttons galore that do things, and so it's a total surprise to you as the viewer as you watch it. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think that they really are kind of hitting their again that the stride, and they're starting to have fun with the film. Yeah. Um, another James Bond podcast, that podcast of uh -huh. Danielle and Corey. Uh, yep. Danielle did not like that car. She called it the Wedge. Corey loved it. And I think that's, it's an interesting thing because I think that to me, it looks like a, a Matchbox Hot Wheels car. That's mm. how cool it is. It's just yeah, like yeah, every, yeah. every child's dream yeah. of a fun car. And then, yeah. and then it goes underwater. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, it's, it, it is kind of, it, it's funny because you're sort of, you know, we, we kind of sometimes think of Bond as being this sort of classic style. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like, you know, you have the Goldfinger DB5, which he can still drive today, and it still looks like a pretty cool car. Yeah. We had that sort of period where everything was really slick. And I think, I know we'll probably get to this score later, but you had that Bond 77 score, which was this really kind of super high-tech, kind of disco-y version of the Bond theme. And that, to me, kind of goes with the Lotus. Guess the what? Lotus We're there. Stupid, uh, yeah. We're at the music point. So, <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I mean, the, the car again, it's just super slick. And again, when you watch this as a young man, you're just like, wow, look, look what they're doing. It goes in the water. It's just super duper cool. And even, even Stromberg's place. I mean, yeah. as a child, you didn't, you didn't notice it was a model. I know today, you mm. know, you look at the water size and things like that. Mm. But when you see that, I mean, it looks like some sort of weird amphibian creature yeah, yeah. edifice you know that was perfectly it, designed it, it almost looks kind of like the the uh the, the specter octopus logo it does you know it's, it i does. mean it is pretty slick and the fact that there's a helicopter landing on it you I know mean, come on i mean for, i gotta say this for, i mean for the times the effects are actually pretty damn good they i, really I kind of feel like a lot of it stands up today frankly and i mean there's even one shot as much as there's like a model shot for a lot of it coming out of the water there's one shot where they kind of quickly pan across from the uh the motorboat yes to the base and it Again, if you blink, yep. you know, it kind of works. It's, it's pretty... Even when he's on his um, his skidoo, mm. you know, at the end, the little water bike yes, yes. that he has, which was yeah. revolutionary for its time. Yeah. 
I think that would look good here in the collection, by the way. Pretty cool, yeah. It would just be like seating. Uh, <laughs> but even that, it's like, you know, they did it so well where you see it cut and intercut mm. like back and forth. Yeah. It's just well done. Yeah. So we have to mention the music. Yep. To me, the music in this film, more than many of the other Roger Moore films, were part of the story. Mm. You know, even as you're approaching, you know, Stromberg's lair, I'll just say this, you hear like... Yeah, yeah. And underwater, like the water themes yeah, yeah. and everything like that were mm. so perfectly aligned to what yes. was happening in the film. Agreed, yeah. Not just to boost up the action. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the, the it, there's great buildup in certain scenes. I, mm -hmm. I, the, I think the music, again... It, it, it's you know I almost feel like there's, there's sort of a whole category of Bond composer which could simply be summed up summed up as not John Barry, you know when when, when Barry kind of kind of sat, sat one out and you had another composer come in it was like okay does he does he does he do what he's supposed to do did this did this composer live right. up to those high standards, um and I and again I, I like it when they kind of take a little bit of a different approach and sometimes because of that. It gives that film its signature sound, mm -hmm. and I, I think this one is a perfect example of that. So I think it really does work. And again, that that Bond seventy seven score is just great. It's, it's phenomenal. It's, yeah. it's it's probably for the Bond fan base. Yeah, it's probably one of their favorites, right? Yeah. Wouldn't you say? I, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, and it's interesting too because again, we, when we're talking about a series that has been around since the early sixties, and you sort of look back and say, you know, what was the sort of the, the high point of each decade? I have to say that that to me is probably the pinnacle of the '70s. That that particular score, that piece of music, is like is it's it's where you kind of it's almost like every decade probably has music that was like ugh, it was really bad, but then there was right. something that really kind of talked like highlights the best part of that era. That Bond '77 score, I think, does it. I agree. I agree. All right, so we go from the score to the way the film looks. Mm. I mean, what did you think about kind of everything from film stock? To, does it look, you know, lavish? Does it take you for, you know, a ride? Mm. Yeah, I would say so. I think the look of it, it's, it's a gorgeous looking film. I mean, it's it's shot well. Uh, I, I think everything is framed great, by the way. I think that, yeah. the, like the, um, you know, there, there are some times in the Bond films where I think the, uh, it's feeling a little claustrophobic, and or you know they're not they're not I'm not really seeing what I should be seeing. But I find that every scene, like for example, when he goes to see, um, uh, what's what's the name of the the bald bad guy? Um, oh right. Um, oh boy, I'm gonna lose my bond card here. Where's again. Fizish? Yeah. Uh, Peck. Where's Fakish? Exactly. Well, that's what he says. Yeah. 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 Great. I mean, great yeah. moment. But even that like that whole scene, like when he goes into the room and he and the one woman is there when they start yes. kissing in the gun. I, the, the geography of that it works so well. I know where they are. I know where the bad guy is yeah. and stuff. Uh, so again, it's it look it's a great looking film. It really takes good advantage of its locations. These sweeping scenes of the desert when Mon is traveling mm -hmm. through the desert is fantastic, um, and the underwater photography is is great. So I, yeah, I, I, I the look of it is just great. I think it was beautifully directed, edited. Um, you're right. The visual stock of it is great. By the way, I have a question for you from that scene mm. you just mentioned where he's kissing this girl that he just met. Yeah. And she gets, does she get like a pang of <laughs> like consciousness? <laughs> like, or, you know, does she go like, I don't want this guy to get killed? Because she's like, I, no, I, I. And then does he whip her around and use her as a shield or does she throw herself around? I, I tell you what, I. Do we have to go it's, to the film footage? It's so you know. Honest, I, I have I have looked at that scene over and over, and honestly, so are you telling me that Bond is such a good kisser that one uh, one kiss and she's ready to just lay down her life for this man because he is just such a magnificent lover in every way. Uh, it is a weird one, and frankly, I would say that that is Bond throwing her around. So so yes, okay. this woman human who, shield. I think so, yes, yeah. and it and again, it kind of doesn't make Bond look very good. This woman who you just swept off her feet and wants wants to bury your children after one kiss, you just tossed her aside as a human shield. But I will tell you this: I know people give Bond in general a mm. lot of grief for using people as expendable items. But yeah. if you think about this person as an assassin, mm. as a spy, they're trained sure. to use everything and anything, including people around them, to get the mission done. The mission is bigger yes. than individuals. So right. I would fence with people that oh, it's so horrible. You uses a shield it's he, he would be hard-pressed to finish that mission if he was dead 
Right. Exactly, so you yes. gotta make those sacrifices. Yes. I'm sorry. I people. mean, at the end of the day, this 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 villain is going to annihilate the human race to repopulate, you know, in his own image. I, I would say that sacrificing this this woman to get to that goal is yes, you're right. Yeah. It does it does take a little little long term thinking and, and and many many chess moves ahead to make the argument. But there okay. you go. There's the argument. There's the argument. Now take that home with you. Exactly. And by the way, what I love about this is, I mean, I think you can count on one hand, maybe two. The amount of very dark Roger Moore moments, mm. I mean, where he's like slapping people around and yep. like, like killing, like pushing, to your point, the car off of a cliff with yeah, his yeah. foot and everything mm. like that. But I, I do kind of like those darker Roger Moore moments oh, because yeah. it's almost like when your dad screamed at you. Mm. Your dad's such a cool, fun guy and he's always good. And all of a sudden he screams at you. You're like, oh, mm. who is that ugly yes, man? Yes, yes, yes. Roger Moore can play dark. He certainly can. Sometimes dad just had to make the face like like he meant business. He was like, oh, okay, okay. okay. Oh, Yes. He no, just had about, to yeah. do that. And you're absolutely right. I think I, I think one of, one of Rogers, again, one of his strengths is his versatility. And the fact that, again, you, 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 when you see him as this kind of lighthearted guy, then all of a sudden he does something mean. It's like, whoa, holy yeah. God, where did that come from? So, yeah, he, he keeps you on your toes. We've got to talk about the henchman. Yeah. Which, by the way, bad on us. When we did Goldfinger, mm. we didn't talk about the henchman. Yes. We yeah, didn't talk yeah. about Odd Job. So poor Odd Job yeah. was left on the cutting room floor somewhere. Yes. But we got to talk about this guy. Yeah, who, who I think probably is sort of the the modern incarnation of Odd Job, frankly, and possibly taken to the next level, frankly. Mm -hmm. So, how do you think the character and the portrayal? Uh, I think I think he's great. I think. Well, I mean, first of all, Richard Keel is is a pretty. He's a spectacle. I mean, this, right. he's he's. I mean, you he's know. A mountain. He, yeah. he is a mountain, and and uh, it's amazing when you see those pictures of him with his hands on somebody, and he's got the he oh does have gosh. these gigantic hands. Um, so yeah, I think he's great. I think the whole concept of his jaws is great. I think the teeth, again, you, you, we like those villains who have those sort of like mm -hmm. iconic characteristics, and I think that was pretty spot on, perfect, frankly. Uh, and he's great in the role, and they use him very well. I mean, one of my problems with Moonraker. Is that I mean Richard Keel is a big guy, right. you know he does not move around you know very well, right? Um, and Moonraker sort of couldn't camouflage that. Hmm. They, they, there was a lot of very clumsy, awkward moments with yeah. him. Um, this one, no, they got it. They got him. Yeah. I mean he's moving. He, I mean it's it, the editing is quickly paced, and so the fights with him and Bond are really good. Yeah, you know you really feel that sense of of dread. Like Bond is really up against this this uh, this unbeatable opponent. So I, I think they kind of nailed it with that character. I'm 88 percent of the way with really really liking the Jaws character in mm. this film, but I'll tell you where the 12 percent falls out. It is sort of the wildy e. coyote moments that they have sometimes with this character over the two films. But mm. um, for example, he's lifting the block over his head and it falls down. Yeah. It crunches and you can hear the crunching snap. Yeah, and he's like. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not as bad as Moonraker, where he goes over the falls and he pulls off the steering wheel, and it's like, yeah, you know, yes. dun, 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 But the other thing is, um, even when. I remember as a kid that van scene scared the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah. When he's like punching and ripping the, the the metal off the van. Yeah, yeah. Which is great, but then they take this very serious scene uh, and they're going through the desert with the thing falling apart and it's like da 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 and it's like yeah. no, I almost lost this life to this guy that could Right. We've established he bites people's yeah. necks. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean that's scary as hell the t yeah. the telephone booth scene is so scary. Yeah. So Absolutely. I think they, they, they should have kept with him straight through as like this very scary guy. Yeah. It, it's funny as it, it's it's funny as we're talking about him in this film, it's hard to kind of separate out what we know from Moonraker because Moonraker, yeah. all the problems you're, that you're citing, they dial it up to 11 in the second one where, where they've, they've totally taken this <laughs> scary character and really sillied him up. Because kids. Uh, yeah. Because it's for the kids. Right. But in, in, in this one, for the most part, they handle it okay. You yeah, know, I, I, I agree. I, it, ta it does take them another movie before they get a little off track with it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're right. They, they, they have to, you know, I, I feel like if we, if, if, we wa if we watch this one and try and literally could forget about Moonraker, you know, this one, for the most part, they keep him 
where that he needs to be. That's and they don't have him talking or get it going on dates or anything like that. Right. So he doesn't, doesn't find his new girlfriend and <laughs> there was all that. I do like too that he's kind of a mid mid movie replacement mm. for one of the other henchmen. Yeah. So that to me is like very, very cool. Uh yes, right. He kinda of, right, he takes over from the other guy after he gets knocked off the roof. That's right. Yeah. So that so he does become sort of the main baddie at that point. And and, and it, actually it also goes back to what we were talking about Stromberg. Because we said Stromberg is not a very strong villain, but I kind of feel like but because you had Jaws, you yes. didn't really need him to be that yeah. over the top. But he doesn't have to be that memorable. Jaws is the guy you remember. And I'm I'm almost questioning my own comment on the eighty eight twelve, and I'll tell you why, because I find that in the Bond films, the producers, even Barbara Broccoli, they take the henchmen and they usually implore some sort of gaggy, wildy coyote moment. Even mm. Hinks, yep. when he gets the thing around him and he goes, shit. Yeah, and he's yeah, kind yeah. of just like hovering there. Yes. That's a wildy coyote moment. Yeah, totally. So it's almost like they can't go fully, <laughs> they can't do like a Red Grant anymore. I I even, you know, I never really even noticed that until you just said it. Like, like when, when Hinks has that shit moment it's literally wiley coyote holding up the sign oh saying. it's like yikes and then he goes flying off in the other direction it's like <laughs> right exactly but but you could probably go through the henchmen and and follow through with all those little yeah like roadrunner moments, moments. Of, of realization yeah. Beep, beep. Yeah, yeah totally you could definitely do that all right so we've come to the moment okay where we have to question our mm -hmm. theory mm. third film yeah. Is it that solid that it holds true to the theory of really kind of finding its pace? I I will I will say yes, it does pretty substantially. In fact, um, again, is it my favorite of of the Moors? Mm -hmm. No, but yes, in terms of of the Roger films really hitting their personal stride, absolutely. I mean, they really do. They absolutely come into their own, and again, they they went through a couple films. Uh, Live and Let Die is a good movie. Golden Gun is a good movie, but again, kind of like Golden Gun to me is just good enough. It's yeah. it's passable. It works. It's good, and all of a sudden, the Spy Who Loved Me comes along, and they just pull out all the stops and and every. I mean that that like you take a chase scene. I mean you had a chase scene in Golden Gun, a boat scene where really nothing really happens. He <laughs> he drives through one boat, cuts it in half, and we're we're done. Goodbye. Go home. We'll move on to the next scene now. In in this film. You have a chase scene where it's the Lotus being chased by the motorcycle, then they're being chased by Jaws in the car, then they're being chased by the helicopter, and then they're in the water, you know, under. It just keeps going up and up and up. Yeah. So they, I mean, I, I really, again, this is a film I really have to take my hat off to and say you, you can't argue with success. I liked in the previous video how you said empirically, and I'm going to keep mm. using that, by the numbers, yeah. by the checks. Yeah. This is the Roger Moore Bond film, which is why yeah. I think it was Roger Moore's favorite and probably most everyone's mm. favorite Roger Moore. Um, even after his passing, mm. this was one of two that they released into the theater, yeah. knowing that this would be a crowd pleaser, yeah. which I totally agree with. I also agree with you that this is not my favorite Bond yeah. film yeah. from a Roger Moore standpoint. My, yeah. my favorite is still Live and Let Die. Uh, it still connects to me. Mm. And... Probably because of your horrible influence, octopus is growing on me, <laughs> like fungus. It's just growing on me. Um, maybe I'm getting more whimsical in my old age. Mm. I don't know, but it really is. But this, to me, is a solid film, and I dare say, you know, very watchable. Yeah, you know, one of those yeah. ones you just don't mind grabbing and watching with someone. Sure, somebody. absolutely. I mean, th this is right. This is a perfect snowy, stuck inside because there's because of the snow outside. Make some popcorn and just just. Eat it up, you know. I mean, yeah. it's it's it is that kind of a film that you just can enjoy the hell out of it. Can I ask a bonus question of you? Please do. Did not prepare this at all. If somebody came to you and said, "Look, I've I've loved the Daniel Craig films." Younger mm -hmm. person comes to you, love the Daniel Craig films. I've seen a couple of the Shawns. I've never actually seen a Roger Moore film. What Roger Moore film do you think I should see? Hmm. Which Roger Moore film would you lead that individual to? They've um, never seen any of the Roger Moore, James Bonds. Maybe you want them to appreciate. I, I tell you what, if they are coming to me as a Craig fan, I would probably have to steer them to For Your Eyes Only. Mm. Uh, again, because I think that For Your Eyes Only has that groundedness yeah. that I think makes for really suspenseful scenes. And it, again, sort of takes place in a real 
world. Yep. Um, I, I would even, and again, I, I think that even though Octopussy is sort of my personal favorite in that respect, and I probably tell him Octopussy is the one you watch next, um, I, I kind of feel like Fear Eyes Only is probably the one that's more easily absorbed. Right. Um, Octopussy, again, I think people kind of have a like sort of a love hate with that one and, you know, have some trouble with it. Um, yeah, Fear Eyes Only, I think, is the one I would. But I like that you put Octopussy after Fear Eyes Only because. Both of them, I feel, have very good spy film plots. Yes, they yes. are spy films. You yes. know, *Man with the Golden Gun* is not a spy film. Yes, it's a it's it's a cat and mouse chase scene going around. Yeah, and I and I, yeah, and again, *Octopus* I think does that part even better because *Fear Eyes mm. Only*. I mean, *Fear Eyes Only*. I love it because I I have sort of a weakness for very simple plots, and *Fear Eyes Only* has that very simple MacGuffin plot. Yeah, we're all chasing this this. Item get down. The thing, get the thing. Get the Get the thing before the other guy yep. does. Fair, and, and from there, you just kind of go in any direction you feel like going. Um, Octopus, he does have that sense of breaking down a mystery. Yeah. And I think that that to me is a. And, it, and it, again, it, it's it's hard because you have to sort of put yourself back in the mindset of like, okay, but when I saw this for the first time, I didn't know what was going on. Little by little, yeah. things are starting to to unfold. Um, you know, I think that in Octopus, that does that more than I, almost any Bond movie, frankly. Yeah. I agree. I, so, Joe, I've got some bad news for you. I, mm -hmm. I warned you that once this mission was over um, and we were done working together that I would kill you. I was getting nervous seeing that. You, you never put that pole down this entire I time. Don't, think, I, don't uh, think that went unnoticed. It's a pole position. I've been doing a lot of things. No, but I, actually I can't kill you because we are uh, going to the next video. This is true. Which is going to be Pierce Brosnan, right? Wow, we are leaping very forward in time, aren't we? Phew! We had oh, a... Wow. Unfortunately, past Timothy Dalton, mm. because he doesn't have a third movie. Exactly, and it kind of goes. To, it goes to speak to the length of Roger's tenure. Oh my gosh. That he, I mean, he did his third, and he kept on going strong. That we have to go all the way forward to 1999. Oh my God! From from 1977. 1999, which was a long oh. time ago. But we're going to explore it in the world is not enough. If you will. So we'll see everybody there, right? Looking forward to it. We'll see you at the next one. Who's who? Are you. Joe Darlington from Being James Bond. David Zeritsky from The Bond Experience, and we'll see you all real soon. Take care. Take it easy.